This is Talking Voiceovers, where professionals of the South African voiceover industry chat to me, Gail Goslin, to inspire newcomers along their journey to success. Today, we welcome Boo Prince, voice coach and media entrepreneur. Welcome, Boo. Tell us your story. How did you come to be in this industry? I think that some people are kind of almost born to be voice artists in a way. Like I was that kid who I just lived for story time at school. I was absolutely rubbish at athletics, any form of sport. In fact, you know how in every class in every school, there's always one kid who comes last in every single race. I was behind that kid in every single race and or just hiding in the change rooms. <laughs> and so sport was definitely not my thing. I just adored reading and I adored stories. And so on. I've never felt completely kind of in charge of my body for want of a better way of saying it. So I've spent my whole life living in my head and I did a huge amount of vocal training and singing and played the saxophone and the piano and stuff at school. So I had this musical background and I did a lot of debating. So you can hear everything was kind kind of around the mouth and the head and the intellect and have spent most of my life acting as though I'm kind of a head with no body. Then I also fell in love with radio in a really deep way as, as a small child and I would frequently fake being sick so that I could... <laughs> just stay at home under the duvet and listen to you know all the guys all the guys uh, that, that we grew up with you know like Alex J and Neil Johnson and Barney Simon and all the guys who sort of went on to to be absolute legends in radio in this country and by the time I got to university I just knew that radio was kind of the only thing I wanted to do and so I was at university and then I remember going to the Rand show one yeah. And I saw Carl Kakillis was there and there was a big 94.7 booth where you could go and like pretend to read the news. And I was already on campus radio at that time. And I decided to pull in and, and see if I could, you know, read the news on 94.7 at that time. I did it. And they gave, they gave you like a little recorded tape cassette after you'd done your spiel. Because it was just play play, you know, it was just to like station branding and whatever. Afterwards, Carl Kakillis came to me and he said to me, wow, you have like an incredible voice. Have you ever done voiceovers? And I said, no. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I really, really think you should get into voiceovers. And so he gave me the name and number of his agent. And it took me a full year before I got up the courage to actually phone his agent and that and that turned out to be Intertalent and I'm sure many of the people watching or listening here today know who Intertalent are or even perhaps represented by them so that's that was how the grand adventure started and they they said to me you know you need to make a demo and whatever which I did and they pretty much accepted me on the spot and I was very 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 fortunate I still remember my very first commercial was for Coca-Cola which was out of this world. It was crazy. Things took off very quickly for me. I was extremely fortunate. So all those years of hiding in the change rooms and reading out loud instead of actually being on the sports field somehow paid off for me. I was very lucky. <laughs> so did you go full time in, into voiceovers or did you start radio DJing at the same time? I was doing both at the same time. You no, know, they really complemented each other. As many of you will know, very often it's not radio that necessarily pays the bills, but you know, when you have more of, I guess, a higher public profile, which radio obviously gives you as sort of an automatic byproduct of being on air, it does raise awareness amongst sort of clientele and whatever. So, so that definitely does help, you know, in your marketing for voiceover, sure. Do you find that talking on the radio is a different style to doing voiceovers for commercials? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, no, they're completely different things. They are completely different things. So, and, and you know, Gail, this is an interesting point because so many people say to me, and I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, people say, oh, my friends tell me I have a nice voice. So I'm sure I could be a voice artist or like, yeah, I DJ at parties. So I'm sure I could be a voice artist, <laughs> you know, or I'm an actor. So I'm sure I could be a voice artist. And they really aren't the same things. I mean, voiceover and voice acting is a beast all by itself. And being a DJ does not make you a voiceover artist. And equally, being a voiceover artist doesn't make you good on radio either. You know, I just always feel really strongly that voiceover and voice artists 
industry is somehow this kind of almost hidden magic profession. Nobody knows our names. Nobody knows what we look like. They just know that we are that disembodied voice in the background. They think we just earn a fortune for doing nothing, mostly because they've never tried. And, and you know, again, if I had a dollar for everyone who's ever called me up and gone, hey, boo, you know, I'm a bit short on cash. So I thought I'd get into voiceovers and just like make lots of money. And I'm like, good luck with that. Because <laughs> you and I know that's that's not the way it works, right? This is This is a real profession. And what you put into it is what you get out of it. And marketing is an enormous part of that. I mean, it's one thing to be talented, but you can be talented in your own shower or your own cupboard and and no one will ever get to hear about you. So there's so many facets to the business. And I think that for people on the outside looking in, I think they just generally don't have any understanding of what we do. So you have your own home studio then as well? This is in fact the third iteration of my studio. I went from, you know how most people start out saying, yeah, I'm just going to put in a little bit of soundproofing here, a little bit of soundproofing there. You know, you reach a point where you're like, no, actually this is not good enough. So I built this particular studio seven years ago and it was fully specced by the same acoustic engineer, actually, who, who built the Sun City Super, Super Bowl. So I, I went, yeah, we're going bigger, we're going home. I love it. Absolutely love my studio. It's great. So is your whole room soundproof or do you just, I, I'm seeing there a few panels on the walls behind you. Soundproof, yeah. I put in drywall, but my drywall, the inside of my drywall is completely soundproof. So that's filled with expanded rock wool and high density board and all that kind of stuff. I had my architrave specially made for my doors. I've got double doors. I've had all my, you can see the panels behind me, the green ones. Those are not just panels. They're they're actually stuffed with acoustic insulation inside them as well. I just wanted something which looked a little bit different and one thing I do miss is being outside so hence the astroturf (laughs) on my panels I thought at least I can bring a little bit of the grass inside that's different (laughs) I take it if you've got a home studio you do quite a lot of work online as well indeed indeed so I'm not on radio at the moment at the moment I specialize in podcasts which is great because I don't have to adhere to anyone else's rules it can be all about what I want to do and the clients I want to serve yes I do a lot of international voiceovers yeah it works really well and I'm sure that for many people who were possibly afraid before COVID struck of like the investment of a home studio what do I do where do I go I'm sure for many people just taking that leap they've actually realized there's nothing to be afraid of and in fact it's a much better way to work Do you do online work through an agent or just on the platforms that are around? I focus very much on what are the jobs that I want to do? What are the jobs that are appropriate for me and how much do they pay? I'm very anti the pay to play sites because I do not feel that they work in artists' interests whatsoever. So so just think about that, $400. And then the amount of time that you would spend auditioning for jobs which are in all likelihood you're not actually the right spec for those jobs or or this job is not the right spec for you specifically. And then the chances are that you're not going to get chosen anyway because you're forced to compete with thousands of other people around the world. And I just think that you need to really take into consideration what your time costs, you know, because this is one of the mistakes that I see so many artists making is that they chase jobs which are worth like $100 but they'll spend two hours auditioning for a hundred dollar job. And I'm like, the economics of that just don't make sense. They don't make sense at all. So don't do it. I don't do it. And I, and I would strongly advise everyone else not to, because honestly, it's such a waste of your time. When you actually sit down and do the maths, you would do better spending that time, you know, networking on LinkedIn or calling the studios or doing something which is actual marketing for your business, maybe upgrading your website, practicing your reads, like doing something, but not chasing a hundred dollar job because you're not going to get it. And even if you do, that hundred dollars gets charred up in bank fees and goodness knows what. And what does it do, what does it do to your ego? What does it do to your psyche to think of yourself as a hundred dollar voiceover? I work very much on um, on building relationships. So typically, people come to me nine times out of ten. They've heard of me from somewhere, and they will drop me an email and say, you know, will you send us a demo or whatever? And what's great about that is 
that you then know that they actually want to hear from you. And it's, and it's also not to say necessarily that those relationships always result in work. But the fact of the matter is you want to be top of, the, uh, top of mind should something come in which is appropriate to you. Quite often voice artists feel like, well, if I'm auditioning for a lot of stuff, then I am going to get something. And I understand that. I understand the philosophy of having a lot of irons in the fire, and it's not necessarily a bad philosophy, but it is a bad philosophy if what they're looking for is a British accent or an American accent, and you have a South African accent, okay? Because you're never going to get those jobs. And so what lands up happening is is it will be a hugely demoralizing experience to you. So I think that in a world where we have so much choice, we actually have to kind of limit our ambition to be realistic to what we can actually achieve. Sometimes that feels like a difficult thing to do, but in the end, it becomes more profitable for you. Because one of the things I always ask is, are we in the voiceover business for our egos? Or are we in the voiceover business because it's a business and we treat it as a business and you've got to run it as a business and the bottom line needs to make sense? I'm not an actor. I'm a business person. <laughs> That's actually a very interesting discussion to have because a lot of people, they don't really know how to to land jobs other than getting an agent. And agents don't really necessarily want to be flooded with newcomers who don't know anything. So learning how to market oneself is a whole subject to itself. Cold calling of any description in any form of marketing is never that successful. Your best client is a repeat customer. That, that's the bottom line, right? You don't want to waste your energy. You need to look at your prospects and ask yourself critically, which of these prospects has the potential to be a repeat client? And do I maintain that relationship? Or do I try and build a new relationship with a, with a repeat customer? Or is this someone who, you know, maybe wanted to make one advert or one phone line or whatever the case may be, whatever, whatever the job is, And are they just kind of a flash in the pan? And you've got to think really strategically and really carefully about that stuff. Because at the end of the day, the most money you will ever make will be from repeat customers and regular customers who who come back to you, even if what they're doing is not a huge campaign or a huge amount of money once off. It's the relationship that gives you the repeat work. And over a period of time, that repeat work adds up to basically being quite a lot of money. So then it comes down to making those relationships, finding those people in the first place. Do you go and visit studios? Because like you said, cold calling isn't always very good. Look, I do think that the landscape has changed. And certainly at the time when when I started out, online obviously wasn't as big as it, as it is now. And so I've been incredibly fortunate in that. So I don't have an agent. I don't have one agent at this point but at the time when I was sort of you know basically represented by one agent I did have enormous exposure and a lot of repeat customers so I became quite well known in the industry over a very long period of time and there are a lot of relationships that I've maintained over the years and then like I say to you there have been a lot of referrals to me as well and when you know somebody uses voiceovers and wants to use voiceovers then that's someone who obviously in a business sense makes makes a lot of sense to to build and retain that that relationship. New relationships are tricky. I think I've been fortunate in that I haven't needed to kind of cold call or, you know, I'm, I'm sufficiently busy that, that things tick over. Let me put it to you that way. And because voiceover is not the only piece of my business. I'm a communication specialist and I consult all over the place. And so there are a lot of new relationships which spring up out of my communication business where people actually ask me, I'll start, they'll start out as clients of mine from a strategy perspective or a coaching perspective or consulting some other way. And then they'll come to me and say, oh, and will you do the voiceover? And then once I've done their voiceover, then they'll use me for other other voiceovers. So those relationships have kind of built organically for me. And I think that one of the most important things for all voices to recognize is just around professional behavior and being a pleasure to work with. Just because you work on a microphone doesn't make you a celebrity. You're not a celebrity. You're a service provider. It's super, super important 
for the sustainability of your of your business to get over your own ego and to recognize yourself as a service provider and to provide your clients with a quality service. And that's what, what makes them into repeat customers. I've seen so many voice artists float into studios, you know, acting like they, I don't know, arriving at the Oscars or something with an entourage, you know, and clients don't appreciate it. You, you're not special. You're a service provider. And I think that if you behave professionally and you give your clients a really good and quality experience they typically come back and also if you give your clients uh, competitive prices do you think that's important as opposed to necessarily charging pma rates no i would never ever ever work cheap and and i'm so glad you brought this up because it is probably the single biggest sin of the voice artist right is we think I'll get more voice. I'll get more work if I charge a little bit less than the next person. And the truth of the matter is, the person who's booking you is probably expecting to pay PMA rate. They don't care if you're charging a little bit less. The only person you're screwing at the end of the day is yourself. Because in the long term, if you're working for a hundred bucks, you become known as a hundred buck voiceover. That's not a reputation I want. I want to be known as a premium brand. We need to understand in the same way that I'm talking about conducting your career and recognizing that you're a business. That also means that who you are and the way you behave and what you charge, et cetera, is part part of your brand. If you work cheap, you become known as cheap. I mean, it's a harsh thing to say, but it's a small industry and the same people roll around over and over and over again and word gets out and people know. I really, I do not endorse working cheap at all. So we should actually educate the clients then not to expect low rates from, from newcomers. Being a newcomer, that is a different thing. I mean, for somebody who's a complete unknown in the industry to rock up and charge PMA rates and they've never been behind a, a microphone before, I mean, good luck to them. If they do well and they get away with it, good for them. You know, 100%. I think it may be harder to do than it was in the old days. You see, the thing about voiceover is that The value of voiceover is all around perception because people are like, I have a voice, I talk, I, you can put in a microphone in front of me, how long does it take me to read the script or whatever? You and I know that that's not where the value lies, right? The value lies in the performance and in the execution of being able to elicit a very specific emotional response from an audience. And very few people are able to do that or able to do it well. People look at voiceover and they go, Well, it's not costing you overheads. You know, you didn't have to go and buy a ton of machinery or whatever. I mean, that's a little bit different today with, you know, we have our own sound booths and microphones and whatever. But certainly in the old days, or if you are traveling to a studio, people perceive it as, well, you've got no overhead. So, so why are you charging so much money? But the value of what we do does not lie in how long does it take me to say these words? The value of it lies in the value to your brand. I could pick up a chocolate bar and I could say, yeah, eat this chocolate bar, it's lacquer. It's not going to sell to anybody, you know? But the minute we start getting into the script and the, you know, the creamy, dreamy, blah, 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 that's where the value lies and not everyone can do it. I just don't understand the logic in voice artists who think that they need to sell their services more cheaply. Like it's a race to the bottom. It just doesn't make sense. How are they going to pay their bills next month? Because every client's going to come back and go, well, you only cost like 250 rand last month. So why this month do you want two and a half thousand rand or whatever for the same thing or 25,000 rand? It's up to us to draw that line in the sand and say, this is my value. Clients are always going to want things cheaper. And in fact, I would rather do something free than do something cheaply. Because if you do something cheaply, people think that's all you're worth. If you do something free, it's like I'm giving you charity because actually you can't afford me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then so somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience, then the thing for them to do would first to get coaching and be good at it so that they can charge good rates. Because if they start out with not being so good and start themselves out with low rates, then they'll struggle to go up to be recognized as someone who's good. I think that for sure, people do need to get coaching and they really do need to be able to, to offer a really good delivery. And you know what they're going to know in themselves? I mean, you know very, very well if you are incapable of doing something at a professional level or not. 
you know. I think that the voiceover world has become a lot more fragmented and so quite quite a bit more complex than it used to be. Before the rise of online, the way we've seen it probably in the last 15 years, the vast majority of people had agents. And, and that was the way it was and the rates were set by them and any advertising agency or broadcaster or channel or anyone else who needed a voiceover would phone agents. And that model has changed. It is definitely more of a free market in the sense that as a, an independent service provider, you are free to charge whatever you want to charge. To some extent, charge what the market will tolerate. And you know what? If you are not good enough for that rate, the market will show you that very quickly. Very quickly very quickly. And another thing which is interesting is you are not doing yourself any favors if you don't sound great behind the microphone and then you get a sound engineer to tart up your demo to make you sound like James Earl Jones or something. Because by the time you go into studio and a client says to you, okay, I need this read like this, and you've handed them a demo that makes you sound like James Earl Jones, and in real life, you actually sound like Mickey Mouse, the client will not pay you. Your session will be rejected and they will call in somebody else. So it's really important to be yourself and to sound like yourself and for your demo to be a true reflection of your, your scope and your variety and your skill. Because otherwise, ultimately, it will be reputationally damaging to you when the client says, hey, you know what, when I actually get this person into studio, they don't sound anything like the demo. They'll never use you again. What is your favorite uh, genre of voiceovers? Do you only do commercials for radio? Mm, what is my favorite genre? Mm. I actually love them all. I mean, I've pretty much done everything. I mean, I've done from documentary to news to commercials to promos, TV inserts. I mean, everything from horror to Mother's Day to children's programs <laughs> to foreign accents, I, I ride, acro ride across the board. And I don't think that I have a favorite style. It's kind of like playing in a band. I think that, that when there is that magical synergy where everything works between well-chosen music and a really great engineer and a director that you vibe with and a well-written script, and let's be honest, all these elements seldom all come together at once in one project. But when they do, it feels like a little piece of magic. I just enjoy the voiceover experience in general. I always feel that it's actually quite an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to play my instrument and to be chosen to represent someone's brand. It always feels like a huge honor. I just love the process. So when you coach uh, students, do you uh, coach them in the different styles? Because obviously an advert isn't the same as an audiobook. I do typically coach in the different styles. I also have to assess where my client is at and where their interests lie. I mean, some people come to me and say, hey boo, all I wanna do is, is read audiobooks, okay? fine, let's, let's deal with that. For other people, they want to improve as a keynote speaker, for example. For somebody else, it might be a CEO who needs to kind of develop a, a better sounding voice of leadership. And for other people, it's, you know, I want to be a voice artist and, and do commercials. Okay, cool. So depending on where we're at, we have to tailor the coaching process to who the client is, what they're suited to, where their ambition lies and their interest and so on. But for voiceover coaching specifically, I always recommend that we start with kind of the four main commercial styles, you know, being soft sell, hard sell, conversational and corporate, because those are typically the most requested styles. And also in some ways, not very well understood by people who are new to the industry. So they need to develop a feeling for the significant difference between soft sell and hard sell, because those are, those are not things which are immediately obvious to them. Spend a lot of time helping people to understand what the different styles are and getting their ear in. One of the things which astonishes me is I say to people, so you want to be a voice artist, do you know what you sound like? Oh no, I hate the way I sound. Uh, what are we doing here? <laughs> 
in exactly the same way that you need to make friends with yourself in the mirror, whether you like the way you look or you don't like the way you look, you need to become familiar with yourself. You need to become deeply, deeply familiar with the sound of your own voice so that you are able to adjust it according to whatever is required of you in the moment. I don't know if you've noticed this, but so often people are really surprised that we don't get sent scripts days or weeks in advance. You know, this idea that you like, turn up at a studio or the session starts and I'll send you a script. Uh, now we've got to do it on the spot. And I'm always like, yeah, I prefer it that way. But I know for a lot of people, it really freaks them out. They become very nervous about that. Are there never a client who send scripts early on? It's the rare client who sends a script beforehand. And why do you not like it when they do? I think I'm just used to and very comfortable with kind of getting the script in the moment. And I also do like the fact that when you get the script at the last minute, there's a certain freshness to your read and your approach. I think there's a real danger of getting a script hours, days, weeks ahead of time and then becoming overly familiar with it. You start to lose the ability to hear the difference between different takes. And also the words start to become meaningless. If you sit there and you practice and practice and practice and practice, there is a fine line between I know my stuff versus over practicing and sounding sounding rehearsed or overdone. So you definitely want to keep that freshness in your performance. That's what I was coming to. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get Wait, you, you to say. <laughs> you feel the same? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer sight reading to to practicing over and over. Me too. And, and what is it for you? What, what, what is the, the preference about? Is it also about keeping the performance fresh? Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because if you repeat it over and over, it's like repeating the same word. Over, it loses its meaning. You don't. It, really it does. feels rehearsed. It doesn't feel natural. Yeah. yeah. And one of the other things is human beings have a tendency to develop patterns. And so if you say the same sentence or phrase or whatever over and over, you will start to develop a pattern where it becomes almost hard to break out of that pattern. And this is, this is one of the mistakes which an inexperienced director will make is they will sit and force a voice artist to say the same line over and over and over and over and over again without changing up the delivery too dramatically too many times. And the voice artist gets into a pattern and after a while they can't say the words differently or it becomes significantly harder to break out of that pattern. There's a thing about understanding those kind of neural grooves that we wear in our minds that is really important to being an effective director of voice or acting for that matter. Is there one piece of advice that you would give to somebody starting out? One of the things which continuously surprises me is the number of people who turn up in my studio or who land up coming to voiceover workshops who are not comfortable reading aloud or who don't practice reading aloud. They might say to me, I read a lot. And then when I say, do you read aloud? They go, oh, no, no, I never read aloud. And I'm like, well, what do you think it is that we do here? Because it is a form of acting, but ultimately it is a form of reading aloud as well. So if you either don't like reading aloud or you don't regularly practice reading aloud, this may not be the career for you. So I think if there is one thing I would ask people to do is as much as possible, start practicing reading aloud and really, really, really listen to yourself. And can I have two pieces of advice, please? <laughs> the second one is record yourself. Just use your cell phone. Just use your cell phone. But recording yourself on voice notes while you're reading and do it often, do it obsessively, do it repeatedly so that you get a really good sense of what your voice actually sounds like and how you can change it. Because that is the one thing that will never, ever, ever change. I don't care if you naturally have a great sounding voice, if you don't understand your voice and you don't understand how to change it at will, you will never work in this industry. So get real familiar with your voice. If somebody wants to come and get coaching from you or attend a workshop, where can they reach you? <sighs> The best is to email me and uh, we do a lot of media coaching. We create custom podcasts. Obviously, we do voiceover coaching and voiceover intensive courses. We also do demos for people. So I'm less involved in that. You can hire me to direct your demo if you want to. But usually it is my sound engineer, Ted Lux, who many of you will know because many voice artists have worked with Ted because he's a legend in the broadcast industry. He does a lot of demo mixing as well and is absolutely brilliant at it.
so you can give us a give us a shout what exactly is media coaching i have a lot of clients most of them international some local as well who for one reason or another find themselves in the media or about to be facing a barrage of media usually because they're launching something it's usually not crisis communication we do do crisis communication as well but it isn't as much call for it as just straight media coaching and so we teach you how to be interviewed and how to direct the interview in such a way that it allows you to disseminate and deliver the message that you want to deliver as opposed to just being a victim of the questions. So it's fascinating and I absolutely love it. And I do have a background both academically and in my work as a broadcast journalist. And so I'm one of the few people who is qualified to see interviews from both sides of the microphone yeah it's great 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 fun and we get to work on really amazing programs i mean i've coached people for everything from trevor noah to oprah to cnn to good morning america and on from there so a lot of fun a lot of fun thanks for well take care all the best hey you too <laughs> cheers yeah.